Um, today, uh, I will have a co-host, Renato Stein, um, who will um, uh, well introduce uh, in a second. The vision and mission of ResviNet is to connect global expertise and leadership in order to decrease the global burden of RSV infection. And our mission is to support high quality research in order to improve the knowledge of RSV epidemiology and to support the development of therapeutics, both, both preventive and intervention. Our goals are to advocate and create awareness for RSV, to act as a focal point for effective partnership with stakeholders and to combine knowledge and capacity required to enhance the development of RSV therapeutics. Why are we doing this? There are 33 million patients, 3 million hospitalizations and 120,000 deaths, most of them before the age of five months in the world. 99% of the children dying from RSV die in low and middle income countries. And we need to stop this. And for that reason, we have started the webinar series uh, through ResviNet. The object objectives of the webinar series are to promote knowledge sharing of the latest developments and publications on groundbreaking studies and to provide education to young professionals in the field of RSV. We have decided to put more emphasis on attracting young people to the webinars and to have the speakers specifically be aware that young people uh, um, are in the audience. The current frequency is bi-monthly, and this is our fourth webinar on RSV uh, dynamics during the COVID um, pandemic. Our speaker is uh, Daniel Weinberger, who will be introduced in a second, and my co-host is Renato Stein, who is head of the Pediatric Department of Pediatrics Specific Training Center at the School of Medicine, Pontifical Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Uh, he is much more than that. Actually, Renato is a very close friend of mine throughout uh, probably 10 to 20 years now. We have been in a, in a lot of um, conferences together and organized a lot of educational uh, um, material in the past and uh, um, being a close friend of mine and uh, uh, one of our um, most active ResviNet members, uh, I'm very excited that he is here with me. Um, I want you to note in your calendar that on Thursday, May 27th, we have our next webinar and you will soon hear the topic and the speaker. It's still uh, under development. The last three web webinars uh, were on, uh, were, were the tag by Fabian Sesterhen, his science paper on how to design your own RSV vaccine. The second one was the lessons learned from the Novavax uh, phase three trial by uh, Shabir Madi, uh, co-hosted by Jesse Grotus, and the last webinar together with Linda Mayard, we present we we uh, hosted the talk uh, by Peter Openshaw on the role of neutrophil inflammation as a predisposition factor for severe RSV infection in his science paper uh, uh, by the end of uh, uh, last year. Um, I want you to notice that we have a, a question and answer system. Uh, in the, in the balloons in your, in your uh, operating system, uh, you have the opportunity to replay our um, um, ResviNet, um, uh, uh, to replay the webinar at our website. Uh, by the end, we hope that you will fill out your evaluation forms as usual. Uh, we had many and we are very grateful that we had such great um, um, uh, feedback. Uh, today, more than 350 people uh, registered for this uh, uh, meeting, which is more than ever before. And at this moment, we already have more viewers than any previous uh, 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 webinar. I just want to put up the pressure on, uh, put the pressure on Dan. He's re getting really excited now. And uh, um, I leave it to um, Renato to uh, introduce um, uh, Dan and to co-host this session with me. Renato, the floor is yours. Thank you, Louis. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind word. It's, uh, uh, we've been uh, 
working together for, for quite some time now. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to help uh, this uh, co-host this uh, this uh, series. Uh, uh, it's my honor to, to introduce uh, Dan Weinberger, who's an associate prof professor uh, professor in epidemiology of uh, microbial uh, diseases uh, in at Yale uh, School of Public Health. Dan has researched using a combination of uh, quantitative analysis laboratory. Uh, experiments and, and very intense uh, field work to understand the epidemiology and biology of uh, respiratory infections. So uh, in this times uh, of the, the, this uh, incredible and severe uh, unexpected uh, pandemic uh, that we're going through, it's, it's absolutely important to, to, to listen to one of the experts uh, in the field. Uh, Dan, it's a pleasure to have you. Oh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. I've, uh, I'm spending the year here with uh, Louis Bond's group in, group in uh, Utrecht, and it's it's been wonderful to get to interact with his group and uh, and uh, get some new projects going. Um, and I'm especially proud that Louis has this uh, map behind him, and as a condition of giving this talk, I finally got a pin on the map for New Haven, Connecticut, which is where Yale is from, so I'm very proud to be on the map finally. Um, Okay, so over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I wanted to introduce uh, sort of what we know about this topic and talk about uh, sort of what the current state of affairs is in different parts of the world. Um, this work is uh, done, uh, a lot of the work they do around RSV is done in collaboration with uh, Ginny Pitzer and Josh Warren. And uh, some of the work I'm gonna show today uh, is led by Gigi, who's a really talented PhD student at Yale. Um, these are my conflicts of interest, none of which uh, relate to what I'm talking about today. Um, so I just want to sort of review quickly sort of what the typical RSV season looks like in different parts of the world. Um, we'll do a rundown of what the current state of the of RSV is in different, uh, different settings at the moment um, and where we're starting to see increases in that. Um, and then we'll talk about potential reasons why we're seeing these patterns and what might come next. Okay, so why do we care about this uh, in the first place? Uh, of course, if you're a clinician, um, you need to be able to anticipate when, uh, when you might see a surge in patients coming in uh, who have uh, bronchiolitis or other severe outcomes. Um, if you're thinking about, um, if you're in a population that, that uses prophylaxis, um, you need to be able to anticipate when the season is going to be so that you can appropriately time the administration of the prophylaxis and potentially extend the administration of prophylaxis beyond uh, the typical season. Um, I know probably many people who are on the call today are uh, have ongoing clinical trials or cohorts that they're following um, and sort of thinking about how to adjust plans for those uh, sort of follow-ups is of course, everything's in disarray now because of the atypical season. Um, and I think probably most interestingly from sort of a scientific point of view is that this gives us the opportunity to see what's gonna happen potentially when we get rid of RSV. If we sort of get to a point where we reduce RSV transmission or um, susceptibility to RSV, what happens to, to those kids who we're saving? We have a whole year of children now who uh, have basically never seen RSV, and what are their sort of long-term health uh, outcomes look like? Okay, so what happens during a typical RSV season? Um, so it won't come as a surprise to anyone that RSV is highly seasonal in most parts, parts of the world. In the Northern Hemisphere, we're usually seeing the epidemics um, picking up in sort of November through March, um, and then the reverse is happening in many parts of the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, in the tropics, I think you sort of have a mixed bag. Um, in some areas, you have uh, fairly consistent uh, disease throughout the year. In other places, you do have some seasonality occurring. We also see a lot of uh, spatial variation um, in the timing of RSV epidemics. So this is uh, epidemic timing across the United States, um, where typically we see very early epidemics happening in Florida, and even in South Florida around Miami, 
um, you have fairly flat seasonality um, and even uh, activity during the summer. Um, as you move towards northern Florida, Georgia, you start to see the epidemics pe picking up late summer, early fall. And then it spreads almost like a traveling wave across the country um, with some variation within the states as well. We see similar things in Europe as well, where you tend to have uh, you know, very early uh, epidemic onset in uh, the British Isles and in France and later onset in, um, to, the, to the south and, and east. Um, so a lot of variability sort of between regions, um, even within the continent. We also see a lot of variation at the local level. Um, so this is an analysis that uh, Gigi uh, recently uh, put on MedArchive and is under peer review, where we see these very early, uh, or the earliest epidemics happening around New York City. So this is the northeastern part of the US or part of the northeastern part of the US um, where we had data. And it, again, sort of almost fans out from New York City where we have very early epidemic uh, in these central urban areas going up through Connecticut where, um, where Yale is, um, we see the epidemics happening earlier in this sort of more uh, suburban urban corridor here and then, uh, and then moving out to more rural areas. Um, so, and we, similar patterns have been described in, um, in England. This map on the right is showing us um, epidemic timing for uh, bronchiolitis, again, earlier epidemics in London and large cities um, later uh, elsewhere. There are also, um, you know, variations in the intensity of RSV between seasons in some places. Uh, so this is a paper that Jenny Pitzer published uh, a number of years ago, um, where in some states in the U.S. you have a fairly regular uh, epidemic with pretty consistent um, intensity, whereas in other parts of the country, you see more of a biennial cycle. So in Colorado, um, we see sort of weak epi epidemics followed by strong epidemics, and that pattern is even more pronounced um, in sort of the north central part, the, the upper Midwest uh, part of the country. Um, and similar patterns are seen in parts of Scandinavia as well. So that's sort of the typical uh, situation for RSV. Let's uh, review sort of what's going on with the current state of the epidemic. So we'll start in the Southern Hemisphere, um, where typically the epidemic is um, starting you know, in the summer. Uh, so this is data for 2019 is shown in red here with uh, 2020 data uh, overlaid. So basically during the typical RSV season, uh, there is very little uh, RSV activity happening in South Africa. Um, they had a delayed peak uh, sort of at, at the end of 2020 um, that was apparent in the data. And if we go ahead to 2021, um, we can see that uh, it looks like RSV activity is uh, at the very beginning of the year was, was low, but higher than typical for that time of year. Um, and uh, anecdotally, it sounds like uh, things are continuing to pick up there. Um, an indirect measure that we can use for RSV activity is looking at Google searches um, where, so if we look for Google searches for RSV, um, typically it follows a very nice seasonal pattern that very closely mirrors uh, what you see in the uh, virological data. Um, 2020, it actually, this missed the, the sort of late peak, um, but you can see in early 2021, we do see this sort of increase in um, interest in RSV searches. Um, this paper was recently published uh, from Australia again, showing basically no activity during the typical RSV season um, and a very strong surge uh, in late 2020. Um, Brazil, I don't have any actual data, but uh, maybe Renato can fill us in during the Q&A uh, about what's going on there. But uh, if we look at the Google search data, again, for looking for bronchiolitis, um, typically a, a fairly regular seasonal pattern, you can see 2020 basically dropped off to nothing um, around the start of the pandemic. Um, 2021, which is the dashed line here, it looks like bronchiolitis is picking up um, maybe a little bit earlier than usual, but of a similar uh, magnitude to what you would typically see this time of year. Um, again, Argentina saw nothing uh, basically in terms of RSV activity uh, through 
uh, the typical season in 2020. And as of the beginning of 2021, it's still earlier that it, it's not quite their RSV season yet. Um, and uh, no evidence of activity, at least in the Google searches. Um, if we move to the Northern Hemisphere now. Um, so this is national data from the US on the left side um, as of a week ago, and there is very little uh, RSV activity um, that was apparent uh, through 2020 and to, to the present. Um, if we look at the Google searches, they were uh, basically completely flat during the RSV season, again, showing uh, no, no activity uh, during the typical season. Um, however, if we zoom in a little bit, um, on the southeastern United States, we do see some evidence that things are starting to pick up. Um, so if you remember uh, what I said was that typically in the US, the epidemics are starting in the southeast and spreading outwards. Um, so if we look in Florida, there's some evidence that RSV uh, is picking up in the emergency departments. We don't see it in the Google searches yet, but the uh, levels are still quite low. Um, if we look at the CDC's uh, uh, NERVS data, uh, surveillance data, um, we see both Florida and Georgia, which are both in the southeastern U.S., um, are showing evidence of uh, picking up. And uh, just as of this past week, it looks like New York City is also picking up. Um, so if you look at the CDC's data for New York, it looks like um, they're starting to um, pick up uh, at a pretty good clip. Uh, France is also showing uh, evidence of uh, strong increases recently. There's nothing during the typical RSV season, but over the last month or so, um, both uh, syndromic surveillance data as well as virological data um, show that the rates are picking up um, and they're now uh, at or above uh, levels that are typically seen this time of year. And in Israel, uh, Ron Dagan uh, shared this data uh, which is not yet published, uh, showing RSV again, basically missing uh, during the typical uh, season um, and not yet picking up. Um, and many of the other viruses, influenza, uh, human metanumavirus, also um, largely went away uh, last year, uh, whereas some other viruses like rhinovirus were still uh, circulating. And finally, uh, in Finland, uh, they also reported no RSV this past year. So just to summarize those patterns, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other data out there that I'm not uh, aware of that we can discuss during the Q&A. Um, but in the Northern Hemisphere, um, there is basically uh, you know, no epidemic during the typical season. Um, it looks like in some places, we're starting to get a late out of season epidemic that's starting um, whereas other places are not showing evidence of that yet. Um, in Australia and South Africa, we saw um, large out-of-season epidemics um, and potentially moving towards a more regular seasonal increase now. Um, in Argentina and Brazil, there's, uh, well, Brazil anyway, maybe some evidence of increases, uh, but it's a little bit early to draw strong conclusions. Okay, so let's talk about why we might be seeing these patterns and uh, what might come next uh, over the coming year. Um, so if we think about sort of what drives or what are the ingredients you need to drive uh, an RSV epidemic, there's sort of two very basic things that you need. You need the virus to be there um, and present in the community and you need the, the virus to be able to spread. Um, so um, we can think about sort of how the epidemic gets seeded and then once the virus uh, is established and, and present, um, how, how the epidemic grows. Um, so in terms of you know, the first uh, piece in terms of how the epidemic grows once it's established, um, there are a number of different factors that can influence this. Um, there are certainly seasonal factors that, that are important. Um, we know that climate can, can influence uh, RSV dynamics. Uh, Ginny uh, Pitzer has done some nice work looking at the link between uh, humidity and uh, RSV in, uh, across the U.S. Um, there's seasonal variation in birth rates, uh, seasonal variation in, in contact patterns due to school calendar, uh, school closures and openings, and um, and just the way people gather during different times of the year. Um, there are also sort of uh, sort of population level factors that influence uh, how an epidemic takes off, um, including things that we're thinking about constantly these days with COVID. 
um, in terms of you know how how much contact you have with people, um, the density of the population, the characteristics of your household, um, um, susceptibility to the virus, um, and on the epidemic seeding side of things, um, you need both sort of global connectivity and local connectivity to sort of spread the virus around. Um, this is assuming that the virus needs to be reintroduced into a setting, which I think is probably a whole other discussion that we could have, um, whether the virus is persisting between seasons or not. But um, if we assume that the virus needs to sort of be introduced from outside, um, things like global connectivity, sort of how much sort of interaction you're having between countries and across different parts of the world uh, is going to be important, um, as well as connectivity between locations. So. Um, this is a map of just commuting networks in Connecticut um, and sort of how people are moving around the state. So, you know, there are, are a number of these factors that uh, are obviously influenced by the social distancing and the other, uh, you know, border closures and all these things that we're doing to try to slow down COVID are also uh, influencing RSV. Uh, so, you know, we're sort of reducing our contacts constantly. A lot of places have schools closed or um, have sort of less contact with among kids than you would usually have. Um, there is, you know, people are moving around a lot less, uh, certainly a lot less global travel and a lot less um, sort of regional and, and local travel as well. Um, so I think we can sort of state this as potential hypotheses for why RSV disappeared. Um, so both less global and local connectivity can um, influence the seeding of the virus. Um, less community contact can uh, influence the growth of a virus once it is there um, and the probability that an epidemic can take off. Um, and I think there's also, you know, some question about whether um, you know, there's competition among the viruses due to some nonspecific immunological mechanisms where, you know, if you've been infected with SARS-CoV-2, if that influences your risk of other viruses. So I think we can maybe draw some lessons from what we see in typical seasonal RSV epidemics. Um, so, um, you know, we know that there are certain factors that are associated with faster growth household characteristics um, and population density um, can explain a lot of the variation in, in the epidemic characteristics that we see. Um, and I think especially interesting is sort of this idea that the epidemic sort of seem to almost diffuse out from urban areas, which I think sort of supports the idea that the sort of local um, and regional sort of movement and uh, contact uh, play an important role. Um, so Gigi's uh, work also suggests that the commuting networks themselves aren't necessarily the major drivers of this, um, nor are school district boundaries. Um, not to say that the kids aren't playing an important role in, in driving transmission, but it's probably uh, sort of more complicated than uh, sort of any single factor. Um, in terms of thinking about what might happen over the next year or so, um, I think there are a number of sort of things that we need to sort of think about when making predictions. Um, the first is that, you know, obviously, you know, most kids who have been born in the last 12 months in many parts of the world have never seen RSV and are immunologically naive. Um, we also know that the first time that uh, a kid sees RSV, um, it, if, if the kid is older, the infection tends to be less severe than if they're infected at a very young age. Um, but we also know just uh, in general with infectious diseases that if you have a higher transmission rate, um, that typically leads to an earlier average age of infection. So if we have a large epidemic, we might see um, sort of a shift in sort of how young the kids are when they first get infected. There are a number of uh, sort of key unknowns though that uh, make it difficult to make predictions. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ingredients that go into the dynamics of RSV um, and sort of the relative importance of those, I think, is is difficult to uh, to understand. And uh, you know, so we don't know sort of the relative importance of seasonal factors and climate um, and influencing the timing and intensity. Um, and we don't know sort of the exact set of ingredients that's going to lead to transmission. Um, so open schools, I think, are 
maybe contribute but aren't sufficient themselves. Um, so we're seeing epidemics in France, but we're not seeing them in the Netherlands. Um, so why is that? What's the sort of additional ingredient that France has that the Netherlands doesn't have that's uh, allowing the epidemics to take off? Um, and I think there are still important questions about sort of the importance of sort of these global reintroductions of the virus versus a local persistence of the virus. Um, so what should we expect over the coming year? I think it's uh, it's always dangerous to make predictions, but you know, it's, why not? Uh, so my guess is that in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, we're gonna return to something like a normal season by next winter. So uh, by the time the epidemic starts picking up in the fall, we'll, it'll be looking something like normal. Um, first epidemic could be quite intense because we have this uh, sort of larger uh, group of kids who are susceptible to RSV. Um, and it's possible that the average age of infection could be younger than what we've seen. Um, and it's also, uh, I think, uh, you know, possible that the kids who have been born over the last year and who are naive for RSV um, might be infected at a higher than normal rate for that age group. Um, but the severity might be less and they also might, it's gonna be very interesting to follow them to see sort of what happens in terms of their long-term sequelae. Um, so we haven't done modeling work on this yet, but Rachel Baker, who's at Princeton, uh, had this really nice paper um, uh, that was published last year, sort of making some predictions about uh, what might happen with RSV. Um, and basically it's complicated and depends on the setting to some degree. Um, so. Uh, she shows here two different states um, uh, in the U.S., Florida and Texas, um, basically predicting that Florida is going to have a very intense uh, epidemic next winter, um, potentially followed by a winter without RSV, and then in sort of a, a, it'll take several years to return to a normal epidemic cycle, um, whereas uh, Texas uh, will potentially have a somewhat larger than normal epidemic uh, over the next couple of years, um, and then returning to something like normal after that. Um, but again, it's, uh, a lot of assumptions that have to go into these models and we'll have to see uh, how this plays out over the next couple of years. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, RSV epidemics typically are highly seasonal and sort of come like clockwork. You can you know, time your prophylaxis schedule um, based on where you are in the world and um, what time of year it is. Um, and there's some amount of predictable geographic variation as well that typically occurs. Um, the COVID restrictions led to a missed RSV season uh, just about in every part of the world that I've seen. Um, in parts of the Southern Hemisphere, this uh, the epidemics were delayed, um, but might be resuming something like a normal pattern now. Um, and I think the progression uh, over the coming years is going to be difficult to predict, but will uh, rely on uh, both how, how things progress in terms of the resumption of sort of regular global travel and local movements uh, and so forth. Um, if you're interested in the search data stuff, uh, it's something we kind of keep track of just for fun. Um, we have uh, this GitHub page uh, where I try to update it somewhat regularly, and uh, there's some updated figures on there that weren't on the slides uh, since last week. Um, and uh, this is all the folks who uh, have been involved with uh, various parts of this work. Um, so thanks a lot, and looking forward to discussing further. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. It was a great talk. Uh, nice and quick overview of, uh, of the scene. Um, there are many questions uh, popping, popping up and uh, uh, we should uh, maybe start. Uh, uh, and I, I, I can also, can you hear me well? Are you hearing me well? Yeah? Yep. Good. Um, I, I may mispronounce uh, some names, so sorry for that. Uh, the, the first question came in from Migena Bregu. And is and I and I may want to 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 give my 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 
my opinion on, on that, if you, if, if you allow me. Uh, why is uh, bronchiolitis uh, considered a, a proxy for RSV and not for other uh, respiratory pathogens, flu, COVID, uh, and, uh, and Gabriela Ispas also asked uh, something in the same line, uh, uh, if we see a similar pattern for flu, or is this uh, specific uh, for RSV? I, I just wanted to, to comment a bit on that because we, we just published uh, we published a couple months ago uh, at the uh, Journal of uh, uh, in JCI uh, a, a paper showing the database in Brazil the whole database for the whole country for for bronchiolitis admissions and we saw drops that went uh, in the same lines that uh, you showed for, for other countries drops between 80 to 90 percent uh, decreased uh, in RSV admissions. And we also ran a, a study with uh, 1,500 uh, subjects, adults and children, seen in the outpatient clinics or ERs with symptoms that were compatible with uh, COVID. And a third of, of the subjects uh, came uh, up with uh, positive uh, COVID. Uh, uh, and we we PCR them uh, for for both uh, flu and RSV, and we didn't get one single positive test for both RSV and flu. And we also we have a, a data for pneumonia for this large database in Brazil, and the numbers of admissions for pneumonia went down dramatically, independent of age whatever you call pneumonia. So it's no etiology bound to that. So, so go ahead, Dan. I can give sort of an answer for more of a, um, a sort of population level. Uh, so, I mean, when we look at um, hospitalizations for bronchiolitis uh, and hospitalizations for RSV, and just look at the sort of time series for, uh, for those two things that, uh, in different places, um, you know, RSV has a pretty distinct uh, seasonal pattern um, in terms of the, the spatial pattern that we were talking about in terms of the timing of the RSV epidemics um, and even the variations in intensity between years. And when we look at bronchiolitis hospitalizations, we see basically the exact same thing and they line up almost perfectly um, in terms of um, the RSV and uh, bronchiolitis uh, epidemic curves. So. You know, I think certainly there are other pathogens that are contributing to the burden of RSV, but I think that uh, RSV is really driving the, the large part of that signal. Fantastic. Uh, there are many other questions. Uh, uh, one from uh, uh, Scott uh, Galichin. Uh, how do you see the potential carriage of RSV playing a role in resurgence uh, of uh, RSV? Uh, and uh, then a following one from Mitchell, is there uh, any evidence to suggest that uh, there, this out of season epidemics also have increased rates of hospitalizations or, or more severe clinical disease? Uh, I haven't seen any data on either of those. I don't know if Louis wants to comment maybe on... Uh... No, go ahead, go ahead. I haven't, I haven't seen those data either. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, uh, in terms of the question about carriage, so I, I assume that means sort of asymptomatic infection. Um, and I mean, I think that's maybe less common for RSV than for other pathogens. Um, yeah, we, so, so, we, so we assume, so we need to keep a distance. So this is why it looks funny to you. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> but the dogma, and so far I haven't seen contradictory data, contradicting data is that RSV carriage does not exist. Um, so RSV comes and it goes and it may be present for a while after symptoms have subsided. So it goes away and there may be still a PCR positivity, but really carriage like you see for adenovirus, for example, um, or, or bacteria, if you will, um, I, I haven't seen it. Um, so I don't think it, it, it really exists, but there are there is anecdotal evidence for, for example, from adults with COPD or so, that there might be persistence of RSV in, in specific sub -cell, uh, cells, for example, dendritic cells or epithelial cells, 
a very low density that grow out after uh, afterwards. But this is my this is my best guess. Renato, what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I just want to move along because there there's so many questions uh, popping up. Um, but yeah. Uh, one question from Andrea, uh, why have we observed uh, an RSV rebound off season only in South Africa and Australia and not uh, uh, in other uh, southern hemisphere countries? Is there some something specific in those two countries? Just to, to add, we haven't seen uh, uh, an off, uh, uh, a rebound in, in, in the off season in, in southern Brazil either, nor in Argentina that I, I have close contact with uh, Fernando Pollock and we haven't seen that. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I wish I had sort of a more satisfying answer. I think, I mean, I think there's going to have to be a lot of work done sort of looking at, you know, the degree of distancing in different places and sort of policy, you know, pandemic policies and whether that relates at all to sort of how quickly RSV is researched in different places, whether schools have been open, population structures. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think we have a satisfying answer yet. Um, there, and there's a question here about, um, you know, tropical, uh, you know, what, what might happen in tropical climates in the next year. And I think, you know, it's possible the, you know, the climate factors in South Africa and Australia are, you know, perhaps more favorable to, uh, uh, to sort of the, the initiation of the epidemics under certain circumstances. Um, so maybe that's why we've, you know, mainly seen it in, in those two places. But um, I think we're going to have to wait until more data comes in from more countries to really sort this out in a satisfactory way. From what I have been seeing in Brazil, in different areas have been opening schools and, and, and while others uh, haven't. Uh, and uh, it seems that uh, places where people have started to see Again, admissions was very much related to, to, to the school opening, but that it's again absolutely anecdotal. So I wouldn't bet on that either. Yeah. So, Renato, um, there was a question by Maurizio Caballero in, in, in line with these questions. In lower middle income countries in sub Saharan Africa, social distancing has, much, has been much less introduced. And this is the place where RSV mortality is, is happening, in Southeast Asia, in, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, Dan, did you find any evidence of RSV COVID interaction in those places where social distancing has not been introduced? And um, any thought, because the question is for you, gratefully, not for me. Uh, Maurizio is asking you, what do you think will happen with RSV uh, mortality around the world, let's say, around the COVID pandemic? Yeah, I mean, my my suspicion is that we're going to be in for a bad, whenever RSV comes back, I don't know if that'll be this year or next, you know, off season or whatever. Uh, I think the first season will be quite bad, both because um, we're going to have this sort of larger epidemic, uh, so there's more susceptible people and I think there could be this issue where the where everything shifts a little. You know, we're more likely to get infections in the very young babies who are sort of more at risk. Um, so I think it's possible that you know the first year could be quite bad, regardless of where you are in the world. Um, I, I haven't seen uh, much data yet from from uh, from other countries in Africa or, or from Asia, but maybe, maybe others nothing on is the, happening over there. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe the RSV seasonality and epidemiology is completely unchanged. Yeah, and, and the, perhaps uh, some folks who are on the webinar can yeah. comment on that. That'd be great. But. Yeah, e e Evelyn, Evangeline, you asked the question. You're living in uh, in Ghana. Would you be willing to uh, through the the the, the 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 chat system, and then we'll translate it. Whether you have seen any RSV during the season when it's actually, or maybe it's still off season anyway. Anyway, we go to the next question, uh, Renato. There's so many, it's hard to, to, uh, to, to, to you, you can also help me because uh, you're seeing also. There's one from Marita Stevens uh, that we will return to normal seasonality by uh, year end uh, uh, and is assuming that all COVID measures will be abolished and COVID is no longer an epidemic. Do we expect a different pattern if COVID becomes endemic? 
or endemic uh, seasonal? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, it depends on, well, I think it depends on sort of the degree to what these, whether these measures stay in place uh, for a long term, because I, I think that could delay sort of a return to normal. Um, and then also, you know, there's the possibility that um, the viruses do interact somehow, um, but whether, you know, under an endemic situation, whether RSV uh, competes SARS-CoV-2 or whether SARS-CoV-2 outcompetes uh, RSV, I don't know how that looks sort of once uh, once both viruses are sort of established in the population. I mean, certainly, um, you know, we have sort of co-circulation of RSV and seasonal coronaviruses, uh, you know, that that on goes that goes on every year. Um, so it's hard to say how that's going to change the dynamics. So I, th I feel like a, lo a lot of these answers are, I don't know, but that's, I mean, the truth of it is, I and mean, we're all sort of just guessing, I think, at this stage. So. And, and it, it's important to, to know that COVID has not affected uh, bronchiolitis. It's, it's not a, I, I mean, we haven't tested that because children were at school, no daycares and all that. So once uh, we return to normal, will COVID uh, uh, be a trigger for, 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 for bronchiolitis? Uh, we have no idea. This hypothesis has not been really tested uh, so far. Uh, there's, go, go ahead, uh, Louis. Yeah, so I'm very grateful, Then just told there are so many unknowns. So we are very grateful to Dan that he was brave enough to give a, a lecture on something that has so many uh, unticked boxes or things that we don't know yet. So uh, that's really well appreciated, I'll, I'll be. Um, one of the questions is from uh, Patrick Maniwaki from uh, Kenya. And he, he, he explains that the testing algorithms have changed. Yeah. So we're testing everybody, all ages, uh, and not just during the respiratory viral season, during the winter season in my country only. So I think we need to, I think he says, we need to interpret data differently uh, from the past. So how are we going to analyze the impact if we have to, if we have a different diagnostic algor algorithm, uh, public health surveillance systems, everything has changed over the past year. Um, it's a very broad issue, but yeah. would you speculate? Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a great point. I think, um, fortunately, for RSV, we do have this very good correlate of RSV, uh, a syndromic correlate in bronchiolitis, so um, which isn't influenced by testing changes. So, um, you know, I think potentially that you know looking at bronchiolitis can be helpful. Um, it's not perfect because you know, of course, other things can cause bronchiolitis, but it could give us um, a reasonable proxy for what's going on. Um, and you know, some of these other signals, like you know search behavior, you know, seems to work well, or it used to work well uh, in the pre-pandemic period in some countries. Um, whether it will, con will continue to work well, it's hard to say, but, you know, together these things can help us triangulate what's going on. So many uh, people I'd like to, to say personally, hello, uh, so many, there's, <laughs> there's there's Jesse, there's Otavio, there's Larry Anderson, so many uh, people with, uh, and I'm sorry that uh, probably we won't be able to, to answer uh, to, to all questions. Uh, I don't know how, how much time do, do we still we, we, have? We, that, we uh, still have, uh, we still have five more minutes, um, Renato. Okay. One of the things that I, I, so I agree that we're with so many old friends. Usually we meet several times a year. So I think some people have just sh shown up today just to see familiar faces and see each other online. So thank you for being such a collegial friends. Um, uh, we have a question about how COVID impacts on the molecular epidemiology uh, of RSV. Um, would you be willing to speculate on how it impacts on the molecular epidemiology and how molecular epidemiology can help us understand what is currently happening in the world? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh this is a, a great opportunity to sort of understand these patterns of what drives sort of the global circulation of RSV. Um, and uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I think that a lot more, you know, there's increasingly more and more data on our genomic data on RSV, but, you know, 
for flu, there's a lot more. And so, you know, for flu, we can, you know, sort of get a good sense of where in the world it comes from and, you know, what the sources are and, um, and sort of how, how it moves around the globe. Um, I think we are starting to get an understanding of that for RSV, but it's not quite as, uh, the, the sampling isn't quite as intense as it is for, for flu. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, because we've all been separated for so long, it's going to be really interesting to see um, sort of how things reshuffle in terms of you know where the sources are. And I, but I, I'm not sure that there's a sufficient uh, sufficiently dense network in place at the moment to sort of capture uh, sort of the reemergence of everything. But Louis might have some. I know he uh, uh, is part of a, a large network of, of folks doing sequencing, so might have another um, another view on this. That's exactly the, the question from, from Larry. Uh, do sequence uh, data inform transmission patterns uh, <clears throat> between community regions and strain variability within uh, community outbreaks? Yeah, I, I think the molecular ep epidemiology data are usually uh, limited to, to trees, to these phylogenetic trees, and we can understand how all these viruses relate to each other. This is for us, the virology geeks. But now we can actually use this technology to understand how RSV travels over time and over over the world. And I think uh, we, as an RSV community, we have been fortunate in a way that the COVID will help us understand how that happens because we will have a big gap and we will see whether the viral ev evolution also has stopped or has paused, at least partially. So I think uh, I haven't seen any data yet. Uh, we are working on a, a few studies, and I don't. We haven't seen any data. It will still take uh, quite a bit of time to analyze that, but hopefully we will get um, some of that data to you. Um, uh, Sidi uh, Hervé from uh, the World Health Organization is asking what the implications of the pandemic are for the development of ongoing RSV. Uh, vaccines and monoclonals and uh, uh, maybe you're not the only one to respond to that but I, th it would, I think it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah I, I think that I would feel reasonably confident predicting that there's going to be a lot of our if we're thinking about the northern hemisphere uh, there's going to be a reasonable amount of RSV in the coming year uh, it, so starting sort of fall 2021 um, so, you know, for uh, for trials and so forth that are planned uh, for this upcoming year, I feel somewhat confident that they'll be okay, but it's it's hard to say. It's, but it's also possible that we might get these, you know, a similar uh, sort of off-season epidemic uh, like they saw in South Africa, um, which, so it, I think it probably depends on where you are sort of in the enrollment process and the follow-up process in terms of how disruptive this is going to be. I think if you have a trial that's not starting until fall 2021, I would feel okay. Um, I'm less confident about what's going to happen in the Southern Hemisphere uh, over the next couple of months because I think there's a lot of variability there and uh, not, not sure how it's going to look. Uh, do you want an, another question that you you don't have an answer for, but it's interesting though to speculate? Um, by Frank uh, Conyers, uh, given the prob probability of bigger su su susceptibility uh, of the population in the coming years, would you expect uh, positive effects on the evolution rate of the virus? Is this uh, creating could be this creating um, a, a more dangerous uh, cocktail? <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, I don't have, yeah, I have no, no, no thoughts, especially on that. I mean, I think it'd be interesting to look, uh, I mean, where we, where we might be able to get some preview of what's happening is in like some of the Nordic countries where, you know, they have these very strong, um, you know, strong biennial cycle where there's basically, you know, some years that are very weak followed by a strong season. If there are any genomic data coming from those countries from previous years, that might give us a preview, but I'm not familiar enough with the, uh, the data to know. No, what, what, what I get from your uh, lecture, Dan, and from literature is that we need to prepare for a more 
aggressive or a more uh, a heavier season, every one of us in our own countries, when we have uh, the absence of RSV for almost an entire year, both because there is an unexposed population, let's say between six and 18 months that would have been exposed, but now has not been exposed. Probably they're not going to be very sick, but still it's part of it. Then there will be just no herd immunity or very little herd immunity. And then the age may shift to the left. That was actually a question from me to you. Can you, I didn't know that. So this is what I, I really didn't know that. Can you explain why the age goes down when the uh, uh, R1 goes up? Uh, in a biological way. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just sort of if, if, if you have sort of, uh, if you have a lot more infection around, it's you, you're sort of bombarded with the virus more and just the sort of on a per contact probability, you're more likely to see it earlier rather than later. So it just increases the chances that, that you'll see it younger in life. Uh, yeah. I, I can uh, speculate. I, I have given so many I, I, I predicted wrong so many things during this uh, pandemic. I can can predict uh, wrong again, but uh, I, 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 I'm not sure we'll, we're going to have this severe, if you think in, in terms of immune inflammatory response, not having been in contact with the virus is maybe a, a a, a pressure point for uh, severe cases, but again, uh, uh, it's a. Com Remember, I am a, a pulmonologist, uh, and and it it is critical that young infants, because they have lower airways, and uh, and this interaction of lower airways, increased inflammation, is a combination. When RSV hits you when you're two or one and a half, it's completely different than hitting you when you're three months uh, of age. Uh, so you'd have to think that there, there would be a, a mutation of the virus to become more aggressive or so for not being around. The population, the host per se, I don't think it will be more at risk because they're going to be older, but who knows? I could again be wrong. So um, I, I have two remarks of two questions before I'm going to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, Renato. So the um, the question of CIDI on the COVID impact of RSV vaccine development, uh, uh, Keith from the Gates Foundation uh, mentions that we have learned over the past months very, very rapidly that mRNA vaccines for pregnant women are probably going to be uh, safe and maybe introduced much quicker than we would have if we would not have had this uh, COVID pandemic. So basically, that's good news uh, We'll uh, to be aware of. Um, Ronda Gunn, uh, finally, Ron, we were waiting for your uh, feedback. He uh, uh, reminded us that when RSV came back after the H1N1 pandemic uh, more than 10 years ago, um, RSV in Israel uh, was more severe than usual. So I think that is something that we need to um, be aware of. Um, and uh, Tina Hartert uh, uh, has informed us that there should be less maternal RSV infection, RSV maternal antibodies in the coming years. So we need we we may to see impact on age again uh, in the coming uh, years. So thank you for 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 your for all of your basically predictions. So I want to challenge everybody. One year from now, we're going to have another webinar to look for all the wrong. <laughs> Uh, predictions of uh, Dan Weinberger today, <laughs> and you can vote already. Three, five, or ten wrong votes uh, 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 predictions uh, for the coming RSV season. I'm um, uh, yeah. so. I think the audience feels that I'm serious I'm, because they're saying, "Great talk, great talk." I really thought it was a fantastic uh, uh, talk, um, uh, um, uh, Dan, and we had so much interaction. Uh, so I'm, I, I think we uh, uh, we did great. Uh, you did great, and uh, we are very happy that we had you here. Um, uh, before I, I uh, um, close this session, I want to thank uh, Renato for being here with us. Uh, he has been, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the, 
the, the guru of RSV since uh, since uh, many many years, a great friend, and uh, thank you for leading the discussion, Renato. Uh, I'm very thankful for that. Um, uh, and finally, um, I would like uh, to remind you that if you would like to uh, contact the foundation, you have the, uh, the email addresses, you have our websites, and uh, please share this webinar with your colleagues, uh, your young uh, people in your departments. Uh, we want uh, uh, you to use this, uh, this webinar that is for free for everybody, and uh, please give us your evaluation afterwards. This is really important to us. I've said it in the beginning and I'm saying it again. Please uh, do so. We want to understand how we can further improve. Uh, we were uh, fortunate to have a, um, a support, financial support from AstraZeneca for uh, the coming uh, webinars very recently. And we want to do a, a, a better job every webinar. I, I feel that we did uh, good today. Uh, thank you all. Stay healthy and uh, see you uh, uh, in May during our next webinar. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Let's stop.